Hello everybody and welcome back to the second episode in a series where I spend 200 hours developing a game in Godot. Showing you, you don't need to be the world's best programmer or the world's best game designer. You just need to put in the time and effort. In this episode, I'll be showing you where I'm at with 20 hours of development, what things I'm working on, what things I'm struggling with. So without further ado, let's get into the video. So just quickly before we get into the project is how am I approaching this from a development and a design perspective? Do I have this huge master plan of everything in my head? Do I know everything that I'm doing? The answer is mm, basically no, but that's also okay. That's part of the process. Um, right now, for me, I'm spending most of my time just getting to grips with Godot and essentially ramping up so that when I know what I want to achieve, Godot isn't something that gets in my way. Um, but just a quick example of how I'm kind of breaking things up is after the episode one, I had some things that I knew that I wanted to do and that I wanted to refactor, for example, and I just put these all down here. And, um, you know, one of the benefits of breaking things up into sizable, achievable goals is they are achievable. You know, I'm not sitting here trying to map out and say, I'm going to recreate World of Warcraft in one month. That's not going to happen. So we have to keep them bite-sized, keep them as small as we want them to, and just slowly chip away and recognize that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And that's really important, I think, when getting into things like this. So here we go into Godot. Um, the initial thing that I did after the previous video was, one, I fixed all the terrains. Um, so if I go to the tile map here, um, all the terrain bottom is done correctly. I think there's still some issues with the layers but i'm not too worried about that right now um i kind of added some things so i've got this kind of like base of a farm that i want to make i added in a lot more kind of random scenery and stuff like that so just when you're walking around things feel a lot more you know less of a map that someone's made and more of places with different parts that you can visit and explore and it's not all interlinked and stuff like that and I think so far I'm reasonably happy with this there's a lot of things that I want to add into this but um this is really just the basics other than the map one of the things that I spent a little bit of time implementing was we now have an NPC if you speak to him he says hello you're like a man who knows how to hold a rod which is a an interesting assumption uh, voice appears in your mind. Fishing tutorial. Yes. We then put into a separate scene with a, a timer and a current score. It's essentially the world's worst mini game. Um, this is really just playing around with different elements, how they interact with each other, having a score, having a timer, and just really kind of seeing what you can do. Um, is this something that I foresee being in the end game? Uh, definitely not but the elements that are used to build this you know could easily be changed to something else we could have a dungeon we could have instead of points we could have gold we can have something like that um and so i think it was a very good exercise just in kind of playing around and seeing what's possible what's not possible and how we would do that in other scenarios i think one of the big things that i really want to nail at some point is essentially how it all looks in the game assets so currently most of these assets are uh, the mystic woods pack which is on hio um and there's some other things thrown in and some other things that i've made but ideally in my opinion how the game looks and how the game plays are so tightly coupled i think at some point i'm going to have to completely get fresh game assets so some, some of the things i'm particularly unhappy with with this is just how the buildings look so from what i understand there's kind of two ways of handling buildings either you have a, a closed building with a closed door and when you go into the building you're teleported to a, a separate scene and then it's a, an instance of that building and you're inside that you kind of go out basically like the old pokemon games or you kind of have this open layout here where you, you have to structure the buildings and maybe handle going upstairs, downstairs and the, the, the Z level and, and things like that. And um, 
yeah, this is something that at some point there's going to be a really big crunch decision of where do I get these assets from? And so my way of thinking right now is uh, I soldier on, get the game mechanics down, and then at some point we're going to have to overhaul the graphics completely. Uh, I think that's quite a good place to be in because otherwise you can get so hell-bent on perfecting how this game looks that you don't make a game that's fun. And I think that's one of the biggest criticisms that I've seen of people who have made games is that they're so caught up in the development and the making of it that they forget to make a fun game. And I think it's really important to bring it back to, is this game fun? How do the mechanics actually work? And don't worry too much about how it looks because ultimately we can overhaul all of this. And I think as soon as you bring in the graphics and the gameplay, it'll all merge into one cohesive unit, which will make the overall finished product better. The first thing that I've learned in the past 10 hours is the concept of use functions when communicating down, use signals when communicating up. And essentially that means when you add a child node um, and you want to communicate between the parent and the child, when you're in the parent, you call the functions on the child node. And when you're in the child, you have a signal which will then emit whatever you want to communicate back up or to whatever. And this might not necessarily be a golden rule, but I've definitely found a, a really strong advantage of essentially using signals. So in the world's worst mini game, which we just saw, um, I have an on input event, which is essentially just handling the mouse click. And then when the mouse is clicked, we call give score. And there's some more extra things I've played around here in terms of trying to abstract them into components. Um, but we just emit on a signal saying this was clicked. Um, and we send a signal saying what score that was. And so then in the phishing file, which is where the mini game is, um, when we we automatically generate all these fish, we put them onto the scene and then we hook into that signal. And whenever there's a signal, we know that the score has been given and then we can then um, collate that and tally up the score. And that's how that works. Um, but I found it's really, really beneficial to look into using signals to communicate. And um, it's something that's worked well so far. So a quick little tip, which most people might overlook is make sure you rename your nodes and name them correctly and keep on top of them. So as you can see here, I've got all my different nodes. I've got my end button, end score label, time label, score label, spawn timer. And the benefit of naming all these is that one, you can look at them and uh, you can see exactly what they're doing. There's no confusion about what end button's doing, no confusion about what time label's doing, score label's doing. It makes it cleaner. Um, the other thing which I think that this is very good for is just creating discipline and good habits around details. When you're a developer, especially when you work with other people, you want to really make sure that you leave things in a very good place and that you do the due diligence of making sure that everything you touch is well produced, okay? And so I think building small little habits like this um, and being persistent with these habits is going to overall... They might seem small, but overall, they will make you uh, a much better developer as time goes on. The second thing is, um, forgive me if this is starting to get technical very quickly, or perhaps not even technical enough, is uh, composition. And if you're not familiar with inheritance or uh, composition, there's some good YouTube videos about that in a good context. But essentially what it means is that you extract shared behavior into different components and then you can use those components on different entities. So I've played around with this quite a little bit and I'm still still trying to, you know, fully get it come, to come natural, I guess. So I've got a dialogue component, a health component, a score component. The basic premise is I can use these on any item I want and kind of build this functionality based off the different components. Um, is this a golden ticket to everything? Absolutely not. As with any abstraction, I think uh, sometimes people can over abstract things and you have to be a little bit careful. But as you want to scale up your game and use items, 
you definitely want to start understanding how to share behavior between those without writing it. Some quick words of wisdom on any sort of abstraction is sometimes it's very easy to get into the habit of over abstracting everything. Oh, I need to make everything a component and things like that. Um, from my experience doing development, there's a generally a good, it's called the rule of three, which is if you have to do something three times and three separate things, that's when it's time to abstract. Sometimes it's easier to add in an abstraction than it is to remove an abstraction that you put in too early. So don't worry if you don't really understand composition or you don't really feel like it's working. Um, sometimes it's a slow process and it takes a little bit of a while, but you will get it eventually. So my next tip is try different nodes and experiment. So I've personally noticed, especially in the UI, for example, there's so many different UI nodes that do things that make it so easy to do things that you're trying to accomplish, especially if you're trying to like centralize things or put things into columns or anything like that. Another really good example of this is, if I could find it, um, animation player or the sprite 2d um you know using the animated sprite is really good to kind of get something up quick and easy but as soon as you start digging into the animation player you really know oh wow i can modulate all these different properties i can start doing all these different things and it just opens the door of possibilities so now that we've reached the 10 percent mark what's next i think for me personally i really want to try and lay down and define what the big new milestones are going to be so what i'm thinking is some sort of inventory system some sort of game mechanic like gold or dungeons or items and things that really start to bring the world together just wanted to say big shout out to everybody who watched uh, if you guys have any suggestions or ideas just drop them below in the comment box or any questions or videos you might like to see but uh, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again next time.